In 2007, Irish authorities were working with the FBI to investigate a robbery and extortion case that started with a man and woman who seemingly had no connection to the victims. But it didn't take long to find a deep hole filled with psychotic behaviour, extreme greed, and a murder for hire plot that seemed like something out of a Hollywood thriller. But this was real life. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. PJ, Robert, and Niall. Sharon Collins divorced her first husband, and she and her two sons moved out of the family house. And it wasn't long after this that she met multi-millionaire businessman PJ Howard. The pair started a relationship pretty quickly, and she and her two sons ended up moving into PJ's house, and she and PJ soon got married. The marriage, however, wasn't official because of a number of complications due to Sharon's previous relationship and PJ's estate. It meant that although they had the big ceremony, the actual legality of the marriage wasn't official. PJ reportedly didn't want an official marriage because he wanted all of his assets to go to his two sons. And if he and Sharon were officially married, that wouldn't happen. He was incredibly close to his two sons. They got on really well and they actually all ran the family business together. Sharon and PJ's life was blissful. They had pretty much unlimited money, and Sharon really liked that. PJ worked hard for his money. It meant he was out working a lot, and Sharon could pretty much do whatever she wanted. She was interested in writing, and she would later say that she met a woman called Maria, who was going to be her mentor. She was going to help her to write a book. She said that she often spoke to Maria. They met online, and so they would email back and forth all of the time. And before long, their mentorship turned into a friendship and they would talk often about the book, but also about personal things in their lives. Sharon would confide in Maria about things in her life. And in 2006, she wrote Maria an email that outlined all of the things that she was unhappy with in her marriage. She generally wasn't happy and she was upset with the arguments that she and PJ were seeming to have on a daily basis. More of the same kinds of emails would come from Sharon and a little under a year later in the summer of 2007, Maria emailed Sharon to tell her that her house had been robbed and the thieves had, amongst other things, taken her laptop. And then one day, Sharon got an email from an unknown sender. And the person sending the email said that they'd been the one that had stolen Maria's laptop and they'd found an email from Sharon back in 2006, the one that was complaining about a number of things in her life, including her relationship, the one that outlined in detail the difficulties she was experiencing with PJ. The email went on to say, that she needed to pay 100,000 euros and this thief would kill PJ and his two sons. The email went on to say, failing that, he'd kill them anyway if she didn't pay up. Or they would send the detailed email outlining PJ and her marital problems to PJ so that he could see what she was saying about him. Eventually, the blackmailer said that they'd accept 15,000 euros, which she agreed to. Sharon said she didn't have any proof of the original emails because they had all been deleted from her account. Obviously, that is a very convenient thing, but she said that that first 15,000 euros that she'd sent had been quite stressful for her. And so after that, she went on a holiday to de-stress. And whilst there, she got a computer and she logged onto her email and she discovered that all of her past emails had been deleted. She didn't know what had happened or how someone had gained access. And then she had a light bulb moment and she realized that there had been a robbery quite recently at PJ's work office address and the computer had been stolen and the computer had all of her passwords and email accounts on it. So that must be how someone had logged on and deleted everything in her email account. The tricky thing was, with that break-in, the authorities had arrived and they'd actually come away with more questions than answers. The CCTV footage from Westgate Business Park, from the building that PJ owned, it showed a car coming into the car park at around 9.30pm, which is the same time that the codes for the security doors had been put in correctly and someone had also unlocked the door with the appropriate key. This was puzzling especially because authorities had been told that the only people who had keys to access the building were the employees that worked there, PJ 
his two sons and Sharon. On top of this, the robbery hadn't been hugely successful. There had been a number of expensive items, including a safe full of money, that had just been left well alone. But what had been stolen were two computers. Convenient. Curiously, on that same night, one of PJ's sons, Robert, had called the Irish authorities, the Guardi, and told them about an event that had happened to him that night. He told him he'd been at home when he'd heard a knock on the door. He answered it, and there was a man who forced his way into the house. And the man said his name was Tony, and he was actually there to do them a favour. Someone had taken out a hit on PJ, and Robert, and Niall. And this man, Tony, said he was there to put a stop to that. He said he had evidence it was true, and he went on to show Robert the keys that he had to their office building, as well as some photographs that had been taken, and the computers that he'd just stolen from that office block. He said that the favour he was there to do for them was to stop the hit from taking place, but in exchange, he said he'd need 100,000 euros. Tony left, and then he called again the next day to demand the money. He said he'd send someone over to a nearby hotel to meet Robert. Robert would hand the money over to him and that would be the end of it. Tony added that the person waiting for the money would be female and she would be there ready and waiting. Robert agreed to this meet and he went to the hotel and waited. Whilst he was waiting, he got a phone call and that phone call directed him to go to the toilets. Once he was there, a woman approached him and asked him if he had a package. Before anything else could happen, the woman became noticeably uneasy and she retreated away from Robert and went outside and went down the stairs and left the hotel. What the woman didn't know for sure, but might have suspected, was that that hotel was crawling with undercover operatives. Robert had called them the day before when Tony had barged into the house and demanded the money and he'd actually waited there that night hoping that the guardy would arrive before Tony left but the timing didn't work out. And then the next day when Tony rang Robert again, Robert again called the guardy and told them what was going on. Once that woman got outside of the hotel, she and another man she'd briefly met outside that hotel were both arrested. The man who had been arrested did not believe this was real for a second. He actually turned to one of the officers and asked if he was on candid camera. He thought he was on some kind of prank show, but they assured him that this was a very real situation and he was in a lot of trouble. The man was Tony, whose real name was Esam Eid, and the woman was his wife, Teresa. Esam immediately denied having ever spoken to Sharon and said that he and Tony just weren't the same person. But the investigating team brought Robert and his brother Niall in to do a photo lineup to try and identify the person who had tried to get them to hand over 100,000 euros, and they both identified Esam. During their investigation, the Guardi actually started working with the FBI when they realised that this case went across seas. Isam was living in Las Vegas at the time of his arrest, and so they actually managed to get a warrant to search his place over there, and they found and confiscated a number of electronic items that would lead them to the truth behind this case. When forensic teams got into those electronic devices, what they found was chilling. They found that on the 8th of August 2006, Esam's account on hitmanforhire.net, which had been under the name Tony, had been contacted by someone looking to take out a hit. They then found a number of emails between Esam and a user who used the name LyingEyes98. It wasn't long before authorities identified who was behind LyingEyes98. It was Sharon Collins. Sharon was arrested for conspiracy to murder, including soliciting Esam to murder. She pleaded her innocence. She said that she wouldn't have been so stupid as to use her own name and her own email account to send those emails. And she added that she didn't even have anything to gain from PJ's death. They weren't officially married, and so in the event of his death, she wouldn't get anything. He was far more useful to her alive than dead. But there was a lot of evidence that seemed to dispute this. For one thing, there were two flights that appeared on PJ's credit card that tracked flying from Las Vegas to Ireland. PJ had never bought those flights, he didn't know why they were on his account. But when investigators looked more closely into the details of those flights, they realised that the two passengers flying had been Esam and his wife Teresa. 
They lived between Las Vegas and Ireland, and it became clear that Sharon had used PJ's credit card to book those flights. Investigators said that Sharon had clearly hired Esam to take out the hit on PJ and his two sons. Alongside this, they found evidence that showed that Sharon actually managed to obtain a false marriage certificate that said that she and PJ were married. This allowed her to get an Irish passport and she then was able to put the rest of her plan into motion. She needed any evidence of emails between the two of them to be destroyed, but she couldn't do that herself, it would be too obvious. So she told Isam that he would need to break in to the offices and steal the computer for her and then destroy it himself. She sent Isam the keys to the office and she also sent him some photos so that he would know where he was going and some money. The case did go to trial and PJ told the court that Sharon was a good wife and he couldn't believe that she'd actually done this. He didn't believe that she'd actually done this. He said there was a reasonable explanation for everything. And during the trial, Teresa had actually been given immunity for her testimony. And she testified that one day Isam had come to her and said that a woman had contacted him asking him to take out a hit on three people that she wanted dead and saying that she would pay him 100,000 euros. Forensic technicians presented Sharon's computer history at trial and it was shown that in a single day, in fact, within minutes, the Lying Eyes 98 account and Sharon's personal email account had both been accessed on the same computer. And then a few minutes after that, 15,000 euros had been transferred to Esam's account. The prosecution presented these bank transfer statements to show that Sharon had transferred that money to Esam's account. She said that she'd sent that money to the blackmailer way back when she was getting those anonymous emails sent to her demanding money. Of course, the prosecution alleged it was the deposit for the hit. Esam was found guilty of money charges and sentenced to six years, and he ended up actually only serving five in in Ireland, and then he would serve a further three later on in the US. Sharon was found guilty of solicitation to murder PJ, Robert, and Niall, and she was also sentenced to six years. After he was released from prison, Esam did a number of interviews with the Irish press, and in one of them, he spoke about the practicalities of actually killing PJ, Richard and Niall and how they had started much earlier than we all first thought. Esam said that he had hired two people, a man and a woman from the US, and he had got them flights over to Ireland. This was all about a month before he had come over and threatened Robert in person. The two people he hired were instructed to poison Robert and Niall with ricin, a poison that can cause a fever, a breathing problem, and ultimately death. In emails that were presented at trial, it appeared that Sharon wanted Niall and Richard killed and then PJ to be killed later on and it to seem as though he'd taken his own life. She added, quote, his boys are going to suffer. I wish it didn't have to be like this, but I know that if my husband was dead and they were still here, they'd screw me. Esam's accomplices were not able to go through with it in the end and they returned to the US shortly after. Esam also admitted that the woman he had hired over in the US to come over and poison the boys had actually been the one that had set him up on this hitmanforhire.net website. He didn't know about it at the time and he was furious initially. He said, quote, I bring my gun with me and I tell her I'm going to kill her and I'm going to put her in the desert or the water. The woman begged him not to and said that she could make it up for him. She had already gotten a message on that website for him saying that a woman had offered to pay 100,000 euros to kill her husband and two sons and that woman was Sharon Collins. Esam took full responsibility for his part in the crime saying that he was guilty but he also said that he... <laughs> Sorry, this is so mad. He also said that he regretted not actually killing the three men because he knew that he would get away with it. As for PJ, he said that he never believed that Sharon was guilty. Throughout the trial, he was very vocal about describing her as a caring and genuine lady. He stood by her side for the entirety of her prison sentence, but when she was released in 2012, the couple did eventually split up. And his sons, Robert and Niall, said, quote, Knowing that we were made the subjects of a contract to kill has affected us socially and emotionally. We are more self-conscious, always looking over our shoulder. They went on to say that their relationship with their dad and his whole stance on the situation has been damaged and 
their relationship will never be the same again. Thank you for watching this episode of Red Rum. If you enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up button. Click the subscribe if you're not subscribed. If you've got a case suggestion, whack it down below. I will add it to my list. And I will see you next week for another episode of Red Rum. Goodbye.